Well, this evening uh, we are returning to Galatians chapter 5. I'll read for you again verses 16 uh, through 18. Uh, This morning, having looked at uh, the work the Spirit of God is doing in us, we do want to see this evening that there are things working against what the Spirit of God is doing in us. Uh, Paul writes uh, to the church at Galatia, uh, by the Holy Spirit, he says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, I I should say at the outset, um, this is merely a summary of of everything we could look at, uh, of our enemies, who they are, what they do, and how to overcome them. This is by no means exhaustive. We obviously don't have time to deal with all of that in one sermon. But I just wanted it to be a refresher to make us again aware of, of the fact that we do have these enemies. Most, I think, professing Christians go throughout the day without even thinking about the fact that they're in a warfare and that there are things trying to stop them and come against them. And I think the enemy tries to deceive us into thinking that it's that way. Sometimes all we can see is just what's around us. All we can see is the world. All we can see is our daily responsibilities and the work we have to do. And we forget about that which is uh, equally or more real, if I can put it that way, uh, the spiritual realm and how we need to be conducting ourselves in it in order to uh, advance, as it were, in this work the Spirit of God is doing in our lives in order to be able to walk by the Spirit so that we do not yield to what our flesh desires. Now this morning we began to look at this passage considering who the Spirit of God is, uh, what He is doing in us, and, and why He's doing it. Remember, He is the third person of the triune God. He shares the same nature and the same attributes as the other two persons, which means that as our Lord Jesus Christ said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So He might equally say, if you have seen me, you have seen the Holy Spirit. He shares the same character, the same nature. He's not the same person, but he is a divine person that has that same holy nature. This also means because he is divine, we should worship him along with the Father and the Son and not limit our worship just to to the Father or just to the Son, but we should worship the Spirit as well. Now, we further saw that the Spirit of God is the love of God, He is the life of God, and He is the light of God. He is that love which the Father and Son share between themselves from all eternity, the love which He has shed abroad in our hearts. He is the life of God, the animating principle in our souls, that which makes us alive, that which gives us spiritual life. And he is the light of God, the one who gave us the word of God and the one who illumines its pages, the one who illumines our hearts to see the glory and the beauty of God in this and makes us want to know it and want to become more like the Savior. We saw that he is the one who brought form and fullness to the creation during the creation week, organizing all the stuff, as it were, that God made into a temple that would declare the glory of God and that he is also the one who created man in his image who would lead this creation in the worship of God in this temple. We saw that when sin undid all of this, that the Spirit of God began to point to the future. Among other things, he inspired men with gifts to build another temple, uh, this time as a sanctuary in the wilderness, where man might meet with God and where man might be reconciled to him. We saw that this temple in its worship pointed to a greater temple, the one the Spirit of God built within the womb of the Virgin Mary, the human nature of Christ. And now through Jesus we saw the Spirit of God is working within us to bring purpose and fullness into our lives so that as living stones he might build us up into a spiritual house to offer spiritual sacrifices to God 
not only today on His day of worship, but the, with the whole of our lives as we offer ourselves uh, to Him daily. Now, all of this is really just another way of saying that in the new covenant, the Spirit of God has taken His law and He has put it in our minds and written it on our hearts in order that we might become like Jesus. But as I mentioned this evening, and as I also said this morning, there are enemies that are working against us, working against this work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, who are trying to keep this work from moving forward. So if we are to become what the Spirit of God is seeking to make us, we need to know who these enemies are, we need to know how they work, and we also need to know what we can do uh, to overcome them. Now, first of all, who are our enemies? Well, if you've uh, joined us for the Wednesday studies, you're already well acquainted uh, with them. Uh, they are the flesh, uh, the world, and the devil. Now, again, I'll, I'll need to be brief in each of these areas, but let's look at the one, first of all, that I believe makes us most vulnerable, and it's the one mentioned in our passage, the flesh. Paul writes in Galatians 5.17, for the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. This enemy happens to be within us and it is resisting the work the spirit of God is doing in our souls to make us more like Jesus. Now we understand the flesh is not our material body, although we might be tempted to think that because once we leave our bodies, we actually get to leave our flesh behind as well if we are believers and will be perfected in heaven. It's not the material body though, but it is what is left over of the old man, what the Bible calls the old man, which is that original nature that we, uh, with which we came into the world that remains in us, at least partially, after the Lord makes us alive by His Holy Spirit. It's what remains of the hatred that we had of goodness, of God, of everything that had to do with God. It's what's in us that resists what God is doing, that part that tempts us into sin. It's moral impurity, which, as I've said, will be with us until it is removed in heaven. And one thing we need to understand about it is its fundamental nature is hatred. Hatred against God. Hatred against everything that is good. Sadly, it's something that we actually share with the devil. It's the same nature that is in him because he is pure hatred against God. Essentially, that's what we had when we came into this world. But because we still have some of, of this nature, as it were, remnants of this nature within us, it makes us vulnerable to the devil. Well, secondly, there is the world. Now, it's not so much the creation we know. There are a lot of good things that the Lord has actually given to us in this world. It's not, as it were, the, the food that we eat, although it can be, we'll see in a moment clothing that we wear, the cars that we drive, the homes that we live in. It's not our husbands, wives, uh, sons and daughters. It's not the natural beauty that is in this world which God has created, which interestingly enough, most of the things we find to be beautiful are really the results of the fall, like the Grand Canyon. You know, I mean, that's, it's really a, a monument to, uh, well, to the flood, which was an act of judgment against God. Uh, Yosemite, Yellowstone Park, uh, the Himalayas. Now it's not necessarily these things, but it can be these things. The world is anything in the creation that the devil can use to tempt us into sin, to tempt us into compromising what God says. Anything he can use to weaken the Spirit's influence and so our obedience to the law of love. John writes in 1 John 2.16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And by the way, these, it's, it's the things of the world that provoke these particular lusts 
that we are to beware of, but what Satan uses against us in the world. And then finally, there is, of course, the devil. The devil, as you know, was once the greatest, the most beautiful creation of God. He was the one who was made perfect in wisdom, the one who had every precious stone for his covering, the one who lived on God's holy mountain, which was in the garden of God, we're told in Ezekiel, until he was destroyed by his pride, led a rebellion against God, and ended up causing not only his own fall, but the fall of a good number of the angels. And again, we don't know exactly how many, but we think perhaps a third of the angels. Now, Edwards surmised that what made Satan fall was when God revealed to him the purpose for which he had made him and all the angels, which was to be the servants of those who would inherit salvation. And the thought of becoming a servant to those who were so far below him in, in power and ability made his pride grow and he fell. Uh, the Bible tells us, and I, I thought this was an interesting insight that I, we can all benefit from, and, that, and perhaps also to fortify us against the attacks of the enemy, because what is the temptation when you have greater power or when you have greater authority? But to use it in a wrong way, to use it in a way contrary to God rather than according to how God would have us use it, well, why does God give authority? Why does he give power? Well, he gives it to those he intends to be servants. And the reason why he gives these things is that it might empower those who have them to serve. For instance, he gives authority and power to kings and governors, not so that they can tyrannize those under their authority, but that they might serve them. He gives husbands authority over their wives, not so they can order them around or make them serve them, but so that they might serve and care for their wives. He gives elders authority to rule in the church, not to fleece the sheep, but to minister to them, to serve them. And of course, Jesus is our greatest example in this regard. He is God in our nature, clothed with the greatest authority and power. And yet he did not come uh, to be served, but he came to serve. And he holds himself out to us as the example that we are to follow. Husbands are to love their wives as Jesus loves his church. Governors are to rule their citizens as Jesus rules his church and as he governs the world. Elders are to lead and nurture Christ's sheep as he nurtured and led his sheep. He is the example. But Lucifer didn't like that idea. Uh, he rejected God's plan for him. And so he fell and became the devil, quite the opposite of what God created him to be. He became one full of hatred and malice against God. He not only hates God, but he hates us. And he would destroy us if God did not prevent him from so doing. But even though he can't destroy us, he still can stumble us. And the Lord has allowed him some freedom to interact with us, but it is in order ultimately that he might strengthen us, that is that God might strengthen us. But because Satan does interact with us and because uh, the Lord allows him to do this, the Lord also warns us to be on the lookout for him. I mean, God could prevent him and his angels from interacting with us at all, but he doesn't. So he tells us, Beware, Peter writes, 1 Peter 5, 8. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So we have the flesh, we have the world, and we have Satan. Now, secondly, how do these things work against us? Well, it's not hard to figure out what the flesh does because we do experience that on a, a daily basis. The flesh will do everything it can to thwart what the Spirit of God wants to do in us. That's what our text tells us. It will seek to distort what God tells us, what the Spirit is revealing through His Word to keep us away 
from obedience to keep us away from the things that will actually strengthen the Spirit's work in us and try to get us off of God's path. Again, Paul tells us this is his primary goal, to resist his work. I mean, why is it that whenever we set our hearts to do something spiritual, that we always meet with resistance? It's, it's like clockwork, you can expect it. Especially when we try to meet together on the Lord's Day in order to honor him, this is the day when he will come against us most powerfully because he wants to keep us away from the things that will actually build us up, that the Spirit of God will use to make us more like Jesus. So the flesh is constantly working against us, and the devil is as well. The devil actually works in two different ways. He works indirectly through this world to try to tempt us, to try to strengthen our fleshly desires. He puts before our eyes the things that he knows will be a snare to us. You know, books have been written on this subject. He is the master fisherman. He knows how to bait his hooks. He knows what he can use to trip up each one of us. So he works indirectly through the world, but he also works more directly by trying to draw us into sin through our imaginations or through deception. Now again, imagination. He tries to put things in our minds that will cause us to sin and certainly deception. His main weapon is deception. Jesus told the Pharisees in John 8, 44, you are of your father the devil and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Now, what was Jesus telling the Pharisees? He was telling them, you don't walk in the truth either. You, you have embraced a lie. You're just like your father, the devil. There is no truth in you. Well, his main weapon is deception. He certainly deceived these Pharisees into thinking that they were doing God's will, when as a matter of fact, they were doing the devil's will. But he works the same way in us as well. He'll lie to us about sin. It's not that bad. If that's what he did to Eve. You will not die. God knows that when you eat of this tree, you'll become like him. He'll lie to us about the world, that the world is good. And the world is something we should embrace and we should try to get as much of it as we possibly can. He'll lie to us about God's ways. They're too picky, too strict, too difficult. Or he'll push us the other direction and, and tell us we need to keep it, we need to be strict, we need to do these things in order to uh, make ourselves acceptable to God. In other words, legalism. He'll lie to us about ourselves. You're unconverted. Oh, you committed these sins in the past and now you're useless, you cannot serve the Lord. He's always trying to break us down in one way or another and to neutralize us. He'll lie about others. Go ahead and have immoral friends because ultimately they're not going to hurt you. You can help them. Just try to be light around them. Uh, he can deceive us into thinking that our brothers and sisters really do not love us. He will try to divide us. He will try to conquer us just as he did the Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians, basically, Paul was telling him, we're not ignorant of Satan's schemes. We know how he works. He's been working among you trying to tear you apart, divide and conquer. So this is how the flesh works. This is how the devil works, how he works through the world, how he works more directly. And we do need to understand that when the devil does work, again, God is in control of him. He may give the devil certain permissions uh, to interact, as I said, with us. He may allow Satan to take away things that are important to us, possessions, as he did with Job, took away all of his riches, took away his family. He may allow Satan to take away our health. He did that again with Job. He may even allow the enemy to take away our lives, as he did with some of the believers at Smyrna. But thankfully, God will not let him take away or destroy our souls. Once he saves us, we are secure. John writes in 1 John 5.18, We know that no one who is born of God sins, 
that is, practices sin. But he who was born of God keeps him, that is, Jesus protects him. And the evil one does not touch him. It doesn't mean he doesn't interact at all with him, but it means that he does not lay hold of him so as to harm him. Satan cannot, as it were, grip onto us. He cannot take hold of us in, with a grip that cannot be broken. Now, all three of these resist what the Lord is doing by His Holy Spirit to make us more like His Son. And at the same time, and this is how the Lord overrules these things for our good, they're being used by the Lord ultimately to make us more like His Son. God uses even evil for good purposes. He uses these things to form us. He uses them uh, again, to uh, ultimately help us find that fullness in the Holy Spirit. In other words, he uses these things to promote his work, the work the Spirit of God is doing uh, to make us those who not only worship God here and in our lives, but who will be those who will bring others to worship him as well. God rules and overrules all these things for his glory. But in order for these things to benefit us, the way that the Lord intends, we do need to respond to each of them as He calls us to, and that's where we come to the third point. What can we do to overcome each of these enemies? Well, briefly, to overcome the flesh, we have to walk by the Spirit. Paul tells us in our text, Galatians 5.16, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. And we need to put the flesh to death. Again, Paul writes in Romans 8, verses 12 through 13. So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Now, that's how we overcome the flesh in a nutshell. We're going to come back to this in just a few moments. To overcome the devil, we need to watch out for him. We need to know how it is he works. We need to know what our weaknesses are. And we need to watch for when Satan tries to exploit those weaknesses. And when we see him coming and we see him working, we need to resist him. Uh, Peter writes in 1 Peter 5 verses 8 through 9, be of sober spirit, be on the alert, your adversary the devil prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour, but resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. And then James writes in James 4, 7, Submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now finally, to overcome the world, we need to turn our hearts away from it. Now I'm going to come back to how we, how we accomplish all these things and I, I really think it has to do with how we deal with our most vulnerable areas. But this is what John writes again in 1 John 2 verses 15 through 16. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And remember, the world is under the power of the evil one, the prince of the power of the air. He's the one who's controlling it, and he is using these things in order to stumble us. Now, what I'd like for us just to consider in these last moments is something we can do that will help us against all three of these enemies Consider again what it is that makes us most vulnerable to the enemy, and it is our flesh. That part of us that is like the devil, that internal ally that we have, that the, or that the enemy has in us that wants the same thing that he wants. I mean, think about how the devil uses the world against us. He uses it to provoke our lusts, which is the flesh. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, boastful pride of life. These things aren't in the world. These things are in our hearts. They are in our flesh, but he uses the world to provoke them. 
What does he do when he meddles with our imagination? Well, he places before our mind's eye the things that will tempt our flesh. Temptation usually begins in the mind, works its way way to our affections, and then when it has uh, command of our hearts, it, it works itself out in our actions. And what is he trying to do when he deceives us? He's trying to get us to believe something that will either weaken the influence of the Spirit of God or strengthen the flesh in some way. Either way, it has the same effect. It makes the flesh stronger. Our flesh is what makes us vulnerable. The stronger that it is, the more the enemy's temptations are going to affect us, the more we're going to be convinced by his lies. But the weaker it is, the weaker his temptations will be and the less likely that we'll be deceived and, of course, the less likely we'll mull over in our minds what he seeks to put in there. Now, if this is, in fact, our greatest weakness, then the best way to overcome all of our enemies is to fight against the flesh. We need to put it to death. Now, how do we do that? Well, first of all, remember what we sang at at the beginning, the, the look. Remember what Jesus Christ did. He died on the cross. And when he died, he died not only to take away our sins and to pay for them, but he died in order that he might destroy the body of sin, the old man. Um, He has crucified the old man on the cross. Romans 6, verses 5 through 7. Paul writes, For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died is free from sin. Jesus dealt the old man, the body of sin, our flesh, a mortal wound on the cross. He released us from its power. It no longer has authority over us to command us or to control us. Now, That doesn't mean it's absolutely gone. It doesn't mean it's absolutely dead. It won't be until we die and our souls are perfected in heaven, but its power over us has been broken. Now, the Lord not only killed the old man, he also gave us his spirit to create a new nature in us with a new desire to do what's right. And of course, that's what causes the warfare, the spirit against the flesh, flesh against the spirit. Now, because the flesh has been put to death in principle and because we have a new principle in our souls, there's really two things that we can do to shore up this area of vulnerability. We can stop doing what strengthens the flesh, stop feeding it, and instead do the things that strengthen the influence of the Spirit in our lives. Now, sadly, we do feed the flesh. We do things that make it stronger. We can feed it in different ways. We feed it spiritually when we, whenever we compromise by looking at things we shouldn't be looking at, listening to things we shouldn't be listening to, thinking about things that fuel it. We need to avoid feeding the flesh. We feed the flesh when we listen to the enemy's lies and believe them. We need to fortify ourselves against what the devil says, against his deceptions by studying the truth. We need to be aware, as I said before, of how he works. When he suggests something to us, we need to compare it to what God says. I mean, that's how he came against Christ, wasn't it? You know, we tried, he tempted him to turn the stones into bread or to jump off the temple or if you'll worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the earth. And Jesus reminded him that uh, man must not live by bread but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And Jesus knew the Father was going to give him those kingdoms through his work. He would never bow down and worship the enemy but that temptation had no power over him. He knew what the truth was and he stuck to it. So he used the truth to repel the enemy's lies. 
We need to resist his suggestions. And again, his working in our imaginations to suggest that we go this direction or that direction by submitting to God instead, by submitting to his will, what he tells us to do. If we do that, the devil will flee. When he places images in our minds, don't let them stay there. Pray against them. When he suggests lies about brothers and sisters in Christ and he tries to divide us, refuse to entertain them. Think about the best, which is what we are always to do. With regard to the world, we need to remember what God says about what's going to happen to those who love the world and embrace it. If we love the world, the love of the Father isn't in us. If we love the world, we're going to perish along with the world. Again, he says in 1 John 2, verses 15 and 17, Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Stands as a warning to us. If we are so enamored by what the world has to offer that we compromise what God would have us to do in order to embrace it, it says something about our love for God. We need to be careful. And he also says the world is passing away and also its lusts, but the one who does the will of God lives forever, which means if we embrace the world, we'll perish with it, but if we do the will of God, we will live with him forever. That means we love God. The Spirit of God is working in our hearts. So we need to cut off the things that feed the flesh. We need to be able to repel the enemy as he comes to us so that it doesn't have that effect. Cut off the things that strengthen the flesh within you. Now, when we were doing this study, I, I, just, I do want to be sensitive here, and I, hopefully you'll understand this the way that I mean it, but we can also feed the flesh physically as well. And there's several different things we can do. We can make our bodies an idol and and spend too much time trying to perfect them and build them up and so forth. Uh, there are people who do that in the athletic realm, people who do that in the celebrity realm, try to make themselves more beautiful, more handsome, stronger, more athletic, and so forth. We can turn our bodies into an idol. When we do that, then we're strengthening the flesh in us because, as Paul reminds us, the Word of God, the truth, uh, physical exercise is of little benefit. But godliness is beneficial not only for this life, but also for the life to come. Uh, we can also feed it by running ourselves down, by going the other, the other direction and coming into a, a state of, I guess you might say, of well-being or not well-being that would make us more vulnerable to the flesh. I mean, when you get stressed out, when you get run down, when you get overworked, when you get physically weak or you're sick as a dog, if I can put it that way, you feel more fleshly, usually. That's been my experience, which is why I try to avoid those things. Uh, we need to try to prevent whatever feeds the flesh whenever it's possible. Now, we know there are certain things outside of our control that we, we, can't, we can't prevent. If, if we should have some kind of chronic illness or we're in some kind of a position that is so demanding that it requires that we do get run down. Sometimes we can't do anything about these situations, and when that happens, we need to let those things drive us to the Lord, even as it did the Apostle Paul, for strength. Uh, that he, we would find our strength that in our weakness and the strength of the Lord. Paul said he was well content with his afflictions because in those things God made himself strong. So again, the things that that the enemy may use to come against us can also be turned around by the Lord for our benefit as it happened in the Apostle Paul. But again, if it's possible, reduce your stress, try to get better nutrition, exercise, whatever you need in order to be well so that you don't, as it were, feed the flesh or give it an advantage. So we need to cut off, as it were, the things that feed the flesh. And on the other hand, we need to do the things that strengthen the Spirit of God who is helping us, actually the only one in us that's causing this, to fight against the flesh. And I think you're well aware of how you do that uh, by now. Read the Bible. I was just talking to a brother this morning about how when he was reading the Bible more in his uh, earlier days, 
how much stronger he was in the Lord, how much more he loved the Lord, how much more he wanted to serve the Lord. But as we get out of the Word, we become spiritually weak. We need to read the Bible. We need to read the Bible with faith. We need to respond to the Bible as we should. We need to embrace the promises of God. We need to believe what the Bible says. We need to tremble at the threatenings. We need to submit to the commandments. We need to embrace, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ who is revealed in Scripture for the strength to be able to do this. So we need to read the Bible. We need this continually because we forget. These things go out of our mind. There's so many things in the world that distract us. We need to keep the truth of God in front of us. We need to get more of the Spirit's influence through our prayers. Asking the Lord for His help, specifically asking for the help of the Holy Spirit, praying over everything that we, we do, asking for God to bless it. We need to strengthen the, the Spirit's influence through our worship. That's what we're doing right now. If we are receiving what the Lord is saying, if we are enjoying this and not looking at it as a, you know, some kind of an inconvenience, if we love Him and His truth, if we're listening, if we're engaged as we sing these hymns, as we, as we pray, as we hear the Word of God, all of these things strengthen us. And we need to do this not only publicly, but also privately. When we celebrate the Lord's Supper, as we do each uh, Lord's Day, and remember the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, as we meet together on the first day of the week and remember the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, it reminds us that we died with Him on the cross and we have been raised again with Him to newness of life. And of course, obedience is very important. Every time we yield to the Spirit, we grow stronger in the Spirit. Every time we resist the Spirit, we weaken His influence. He doesn't get any weaker, but His influence in us weakens. And then fasting, which is interesting because fasting will make us weaker. And it will sometimes, at least, I guess, you know, we, I don't know if you've had this experience, but sometimes when you fast, you can feel your flesh welling up in you. And when you can feel that, and you know that it's there and it's power, it does humble you. And that's the whole purpose behind fasting, is to humble yourself before the Lord, realize your weakness, call out to Him for His grace. And you can do that when you're more humbled over your sin. Now, the stronger the Spirit's influence becomes in us, the easier it will be to yield to Him as He seeks to lead us in the ways of the Lord which is what Paul means when he says in Galatians 5.16, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. The stronger the Spirit's influence is within us, the easier it's going to be to yield to Him and the weaker the flesh is going to be. And of course, if it's weaker, it's going to be easier to resist it. Now let's also not forget this last thing. And that is that when the enemy attacks, he only does so by God's permission. So when God allows it, there's always a good purpose behind it. He's trying to teach us something. So if we understand what that is, we need to learn what it is he's trying to teach us. And then submit to that instruction because the lesson isn't going to be finished until we learn the lesson that the Lord is seeking uh, to teach us. So I think as we see the enemy coming against us, we see the enemies of our, of our souls coming against us, we need to realize it's only happening because God is allowing it. He wants to teach us something, learn the lesson, and then the onslaught will come to an end. God intends it for our good. And when that good has been accomplished, then it's no longer that, that attack is, is really no longer necessary. Well, let's, um, let's we, we've seen a lot of things this evening, but uh, again, just remember we do have enemies. They are working against us, but we can overcome them using God's, God's ways. Particularly, we need to put our flesh to death and grow stronger in the spirit. If we do, then we will be able more easily to overcome the enemy. And again, that last point, learn what the Lord is seeking to teach and the lesson will, will end. Well, let's, let's bow in a few moments of silent prayer and let's ask the Lord to, um, 
Help us learn these things, apply these things, and become stronger uh, by so doing.